Seeing Nicole that day was like spotting a snow leopard in the wild. It had been 44 years since I last saw her face. And there she was, sitting at the end of the bar, like she never left. I nearly pinched myself in disbelief. A Christmas miracle, maybe? She looked as stunning as ever, wrapped in an expensive mink coat and black leather boots. Her hair was shorter and gray, but it was undoubtedly her. I stared down at my drink, contemplating whether I should approach her or not. We were old people now, on the back ends of our lives. What would I even say? So much time has passed. Curiosity got the better of me, so I meandered over, I meandered over to her, beer in hand. Nicole? Is that you? She didn't look up from her phone. My face felt hot with embarrassment. My fight or flight response screamed, flight. Nicole? I repeated, gently tapping her shoulder. She looked up and we locked eyes. Those lush green eyes had captured a place in my heart all these years. Eddie? Oh my god, Eddie! She hugged me, and I felt my anxiety melt away. How long has it been? I still had hair the last time we met, so it must be ages. Nicole nearly spat out her drink. You haven't changed one bit, Eddie. And this bar is almost exactly how I remembered it. She wasn't lying. McKaylee's was a spitting image of its old self. It was a family bar that had been kept in the family, passed down from generation to generation, dating back to my father's time. It was not the hippiest establishment anymore, but it was one that I cherished. It was my tradition to sneak out of this pub on December 24th every year for a quick pint. It gave me a chance to reflect on my life and momentarily escape the heckness of the holiday season. I think deep down I secretly hoped that I would spot Nicole here again someday. Do you remember when we stole Gary's dad's truck and drove it right here? We were begging Catherine for a drink. I chuckled. How could I forget the desperation? It's owned by her son David now. The kind of thing would never slide anymore. We both laughed as all I want for Christmas played on the jukebox in the background. Besides a couple of stragglers, the bar was dead. People off with their families, enjoying the festivities. What about this spot in particular? As I pointed above her to the mistletoe hanging from the support beam, I scoped out this spot specifically back in the day when I had game. Nicole's face turned a bright pink. Oh, I'm old, but I still remember. We exchanged pleasantries as I ordered another round from David. She was passing through to spend Christmas at her daughter's place in a nearby city. She filled me in on her life. She had two daughters from two different marriages and two grandkids. One boy, one girl. She pulled out a picture from her purse as we smiled and admired their cuteness. Jeez, I've been talking your ear off, Eddie. How about yourself? What have you been up to all these years? Me? Oh, not much, really. I never left. I own all of the Rudderson's pharmacies in town. Got myself a wife, Karen, and a white picket fence. We had a daughter, Mackenzie, and she has two grandchildren that we spoiled to death, Cleo and Veronica. It was my turn to show and tell. She smiled as she examined the pictures closely. We are planning on spending Christmas at Mackenzie's with the little ones tomorrow. Oh my goodness, they are so adorable. How old are they, if you don't mind me asking? And what race? They look so beautiful. Cleo is four and Veronica will be two in a few weeks. Mackenzie married a Filipino fellow. So they are my little halfies, I joked. Well, they look extremely exotic and so precious. As I mustered the courage to ask what had been eating away at me for the past 44 years, why did you leave without saying goodbye? Nicole stared at her empty drink, rolling the ice cubes around. She paused and took a deep breath. I never wanted to leave. 
I had to leave. Nicole went on to explain that her father had had an episode. I also knew about her father's anger issues. Nicole would wear long sleeve shirts to hide the bruising some days when it got really bad. That night was a pinnacle of the abuse. Her mother was almost beaten to death. When he passed out from his drunken stupor, Nicole and her mother had fled town. The jovial atmosphere turned solemn as I processed what I just heard. I just wish you would have called me once as you were settled. It really screwed me up, Nicole, for a long time. I'm really sorry, Eddie. I was young. She put her hand on mine for a moment. I was terrified you'd find us. You know how quickly word spreads in this town. We both stared out the window, watching heavy snowflakes fall down from the heavens. I should go. Nicole grabbed the bill before I could reach it. I'm sorry, Nicole. Stay for one more, please. She got up and paid her tab at the register. She came back with a troubled look on her face. I may be really out of line here, Eddie, but I would be kicking myself if I didn't at least try. She took a deep breath and handed me a folded napkin. I wrote down the address where I'll be staying tonight and my number. I leave in the morning, but I would love for you to come by tonight. I shifted uneasily in my chair as a magnitude of the question waved heavily on me. You don't have to answer now. Just give me a call. She gave me a kiss on the cheek and left, the snow leopard escaping back into the mountains. We had Christmas Eve dinner at Mackenzie's that night, which I was barely present for. Thoughts were racing through my mind from earlier at the bar. I couldn't help but imagine what could have been with Nicole, had she never left. The chemistry was still there. I could feel it running electric through my veins. It was a feeling I hadn't felt with my wife Karen, not to that level at least. I still loved her and the life we had built, but if I was being honest with myself, it just wasn't the same. At the same time, this was insane. I'm an old man. Had this been a couple years after she left, maybe things would have been different. But I had responsibilities now. Lifelong commitments forged with my wife and children. When my wife Karen was cutting the cake, I snuck out to the garage to make the call. Hello? Hi, Nicole. It's Eddie. Listen, Nicole. I cut in, pausing a moment to think about how I wanted to phrase things. I don't think it's a good idea for me to come over. I hope you understand. There was a long pause that I rushed to fill. I have a family now, Nicole. It was really nice seeing you again, though. I hope I see you again around town soon. But I thought you wanted to rekindle what we had. I could feel the loneliness and sadness in her voice. I never said that, Nicole. I had just really missed seeing you. There was another long pause. Well, I'm really sorry to hear that, Eddie, Nicole said, sobbing. I thought it was never too late for love. I guess I was wrong. Nicole, you know what? Maybe I'll stop by Mackenzie's tomorrow before I leave. A nice little Christmas surprise. See what Chloe and Veronica think about their granddad seducing a former lover. My heartbeat sped a hundred miles a minute. Regret washed over me for even starting a conversation with her in the first place. Nicole, I don't know what you think happened here today, but it was nothing. Just two old friends running into each other at the bar. Why are you doing this? That comment set her off. Friends? She cried, and sobbing getting louder. Well, I'll see you tomorrow then, friend. 22 Bridgestone Boulevard. How did she know the address? Nicole. Nicole disconnected the call, leaving me a stressed, confused mess. I called back two times, which went straight to voicemail. I didn't sleep that night, anticipating Christmas Day chaos, but Nicole never showed up. We had a splendid day with the grandchildren. Lots of laughs and gifts giving to be had. Part of me was still very wary. Afraid of what Nicole was capable of doing or saying to uproot my family, but she never made an appearance until I turned 
on the evening news. This is Channel 19 Breaking News. In a scene right here out of a movie, local county sheriffs arrested the Black Widow killer Courtney Dolling, wanted for the murders of former husbands, NYC entrepreneur David Dolling, and career criminal Alonzo Harrow, along with a slew of other charges, including child trafficking. She had been known to police for decades, going by many aliases. In an epic turn of events, she was tracked down by police at the small town motel in Hollow's Valve on Christmas Day. More information coming by the minute here, as police began to unravel this Christmas Day miracle. The footage on the screen was Nicole in her mink fur coat being carried away by law enforcement. My jaw dropped to the floor. I was astounded at what I was witnessing. I would have never imagined that the woman I loved so long ago could have been entangled in something so sinister. And to be close to such evil at such a magical time of the year. I decided in that moment to give up on McKaylee's Christmas Eve tradition. I figured traditions should be celebrated with people you love, not with people that you, not with people that you never knew. Okay, everyone. The next story is from an author named P.F. McGraw. He actually has a book series on Amazon at the moment, and it's for Kindle edition. If you have Kindle Unlimited, it's just zero dollars. But the Kindle price is only $3.99 per book. There is three in the series. He writes really good short stories. I'm about to read one of them to you. So you can go over to Amazon and check out his book. Also, the books have a five-star rating. So please go check them out. I will be linking the link down below to his book and to this short story. You're a fucking idiot if you believe that. Jeremy spat from across the lunch table, flex a banana pulp flying through the air and tickling my cheeks in a sloppy mist. I felt my face get hot while the other kids stared at me in delight as I realized my growing embarrassment. Do you believe in the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy also? Jeremy pressed in glowing delight, stuffing his face with another mouthful of banana without finishing the first. No, I mean, well, that broke the dam and everyone else started laughing. The state of being an adolescent boy is, for all intents and purposes, an act of mental torment. Humorous playground fascination with all the gross and disgusting, nearly disgusting, never really abates. It simply grows more potent as we realize that the disgust we have with our own bodies is inexorably tied to the delight that we extract from them. And no one on the earth is mature enough to handle the paradox. Maybe Santa will give you some tampons, Jeremy goffed, blissfully unaware of the clump of banana mush that he'd laughed into his sinuses and was now peeking out of his nostril. Shut up, I fired back, grasping for any words that felt defensive as the lunch table group laughed harder. Jeremy wasn't particularly funny, of course, that the simple reality was that someone other than themselves was being abused, and survival meant encouraging the pain. I'm getting a switch. I checked the closet where my parents kept the presents, and I'm getting a 60-inch TV for my room, too. Jeremy narrowed his eyes at me. If Santa's real, he breathed, then why are your Christmas presents hiding in your parents' closet? I thought of a million things to say. I'm lucky enough to get presents from my parents in addition to Saint Nick. Santa works in mysterious ways. If Jeremy's parents loved him enough, maybe he'd get nice presents instead of punching anyone who asked what he got for Christmas. Maybe he could get a couple more years of gifts from Santa, since he was short enough to pass for a fourth grader. I tried to say one of those things, any of them, but the heat in my head pushed into my eyes and nose. Speech gave away to gasp, and my face started leaking from every orifice. Oh, fuck. Jeremy whispered, are you going to cry? 
I want to deny it, but all my effort was focused on holding the tears back. Jeremy's lips curled like the Grinch. Man, I really wish my Uncle Fred was here. He once punched my little sister so hard that she's been afraid to cry ever since. He hates little bitches like you. My dad had once told me that the bigger man walks away from an argument. So I turned and headed calmly apart from the group. Wait, Jeremy called after me. I paused. He threw the rest of the banana at the back of my neck with a smack. The cold clumps coagulating in my hair. I pulled it away, but it had the consistency of fresh snot. So it just worked its way deep into my scalp. I imagined a valiant parting shot, some brilliant quip that put everyone in their place and shut them up indefinitely. But there was nothing my embarrassed mind could conjure. I walked away as they laughed at me, my teary eyes heavy as rocks. I still put out a glass of milk and 19 cookies. My parents gave each other a knowing look, but told myself to ignore it. Sure, I was 13, but I was their only kid. They weren't in a rush for me to grow up either. I snuck out to watch the fireplace after my parents had gone to bed. A subconscious voice told me to enjoy the Santa story as much as I possibly could in this moment and I didn't question why I knew to obey it. I didn't want to ask if Santa was about to die in my imagination forever. So I curled up in the corner of the couch, near enough to the freshly out of fire to roll into the massage of its dying warmth. The tree behind me was filled with presents. I knew that I could count them right now, just after my parents had gone to bed, and compare it with the number I woke up in the morning. I realized that would answer the Santa question forever. That's why I didn't check. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping at the window. I bolted upright, heart thudding, and looked into the darkness. A face stared back. I wanted to shit my mouth and puke my pants, but I couldn't move. It smiled. Below the crooked teeth dangled a scraggly white beard. My head spun. Slowly, quietly, he lifted the window. I couldn't move. The man reached his skinny arms into the house, pulled himself up, and tumbled inside with a soft thud. Then he stood, dusted his pants, and lifted a loose red bag. He was dressed in red cloth with white trim. Merry Christmas, little boy, he wheezed. You know who I am, the creepy man in my living room? I whispered back. I'm Santa and I'm real, he announced quietly, enough not to disturb any potential sleeping residents. Since you believe me all these years, I have an extra special treat for you. He smelled like the reason that showers were invented. What? I gasped softly. What are you going to do? His smile captured the essence of the exact moment when eggnog curdles. I'm switching your presents out for even bigger presents, kid. Congrats. I backed up to the corner of the couch. Now, I know that your parents were giving you some electronics and probably some cash, right? I eat. If you just tell Santa where they are, I'll be able to bring them back to the North Pole and return an even better version. You'll need to help me get them outside very quietly so that I don't disturb my reindeer. Um... Don't you need the reindeer to be awake and ready go if you're going to move my presence, I asked tentatively. Those are the kinds of questions that end up with naughty children crying on Christmas morning, he pressed, now with a definitive edge in his tone. So, are you going to help Santa find the best presents? His voice dropped an octave. Or are you going to go on the bad list? I pulled my knees up to my chin. Um, I think the biggest presents are in the biggest boxes, Santa. He slowly stalked towards me, my stomach growing colder. In each footfall of his boot, he stopped right next to the couch, blocking all escapes as he towered over me in the darkness. Are you giving me lip? He asked icily. I shook my head, trembling. Are you going to help, Santa, or are things about to go bad for you? He whispered. I remember my dad's advice. I sprang from the couch, pulling myself over its back. His grip caught my arm like a vice, 
and pain shot from my shoulder to my fingertips. His other hand clamped down on my mouth with such strength and I knew he was going to get what he wanted. Okay, he grumbled. Looks like we're going to have a Christmas the hard way. A light bright enough to hurt my eyes flooded the room. The man's grip slackened. What the fuck? He called out. Thump, thump, thump. Someone was walking closer. Who the... Then my tormentor was lifted into the air, legs kicking completely helpless, as a second man held him aloft with just one hand. I could barely make out their silhouettes as my eyes burned in the new fallen brightness. This is not the Christmas spirit, the second man bellowed in a voice that was somehow both light and deep at the same time. Hearing him filled me with a warmth as the fear drained from my body. The burglar gurgled. You are confused. The rule really is simple. The second man called out. On Christmas, of all days, don't be an asshole. Then he dropped the skinny man to the floor with a thud. That was followed by a blast of golden light that sent sparks into the air. I looked down in shock. He had suddenly became bound, head and foot, with tightly wrapped red and green ribbons. His mouth was gagged with a beautiful red satin bow. My savior stood over me, still obscured in the bright light. Stand up, he ordered kindly. I did as he commanded, vaguely noticing that the two men were dressed alike. What did you want for Christmas more than anything, he asked. Um, I responded dazed. Well, I guess I really wanted a, um, a switch, but I mean, I think I got that, so... No, I mean, what do you really want? Even if it won't fit wrapped under the tree. I froze. I can see it in your eyes, he continued softly. There's something you want more than anything else. A wish that you're afraid to tell anyone. Why don't you whisper it to me? He leaned down and I told him what I never said aloud before. Feeling both embarrassed and excited to finally put it into words. When I finished, he leaned back looked down at me and smiled. Merry Christmas, he offered warmly. Then after laying his finger aside of his nose, he was gone. I wasn't sure if he'd move like a shadow when I was blinking, or it was a trick of the bright light, or if he had just simply vanished in front of me. But very suddenly, I was alone in the darkened room with a groaning fake Santa gift wrapped at my feet. All I know for sure is that some aspects of Christmas are fate. The phony Kringle turned out to be Jeremy's dirtbag uncle, Fred, who had been paroled a week earlier and was living in Jeremy's garage. Uncle Fred had pressed Jeremy for which kids had the best presents to steal, and my name came up because I still believed that Santa was responsible for a lot of expensive presents. Uncle Fred cried when the cops took him away, saying he couldn't go back to being someone's Christmas bitch. I wasn't sure what that meant, but I didn't have time to ponder it. The police wanted to know what had caused Uncle Fred to get bound so tightly. Well, I shrugged. I guess we don't know what we have inside until a really amazing moment forces us to find out. Some gifts can't be wrapped under the tree. And the best presents aren't physical things. Sometimes the line between gift and circumstance gets blurred and we're left not knowing why life works out the way it does. In those moments, all we can really do is be thankful that the things beyond our control end up better than we could have planned. How else to explain what happened to Jeremy? He was a accomplice to his uncle's felony, but they didn't want to lock him up. Instead, he got 120 hours of service without a choice how to spend it. Jeremy, the shortest kid in class, was forced to dress up like an elf and help the local Santa actor as he went to the hospitals and mall to meet with the little kids who still believed. He tried to avoid the rest of the lunch table crew when they came by to take pictures of him in his ridiculous outfit, but they were relentless. Jeremy had to delete all of his social media as countless pictures of him dressed up in a candy cane tights and matching pointy hat shoe combination went viral. He was so humiliated that he never talked to any of us again. I no longer claim to believe that Santa's real, but I know that somehow I ended up getting the secret wish that I only ever uttered to one person. 
Merry Christmas, everyone. This story is I Was Hired by Santa, But I Think He Is the Krampus, written by the narration channel Mademoiselle McCreepsta. Be sure to check her out and subscribe if you like what you hear. The link should be in the description below. Enjoy. Who doesn't love Christmas? Snuggling under a warm blanket with a cup of hot chocolate in your hand, putting a cliche Christmas movie on the TV as the snow falls outside. <laughs> well, not me. A few months ago, I would have told you that Christmas was my favorite time of year. I couldn't stand the summer because I felt like I was withering from the heat. I longed for the caress of icy wind of winter on my cheeks. I loved to go Christmas shopping for gifts, to decorate my house in the most festive way possible, and spend the holiday with my whole family, a time filled with love. But it is unfortunately a feeling that I will never feel again. You see, last year, my finances weren't really at their best. I had a pretty difficult year after losing my job at the start. I had tried to find another one, but jobs were scarce where I lived. I couldn't see myself moving and disrupting my whole life just to find a job someplace else. At least, not until I'd done everything in my power to find one right here. On the morning of November 25th, 2019, I opened the paper to see if there were any new jobs that I could apply for. When I saw an ad with the intriguing headline, Santa needs you. I immediately started reading it. The announcement was just a few lines long. Do you love Christmas? Do you dream of helping to create its magic? Are you available for the two weeks leading up to Christmas Eve? And would you love to earn $50 an hour? If you answered yes to all these questions, look no further. Send us a letter that will make us feel all that Christmas means to you before December 1st, 2019 at the address below. Elves Recruitment Division, Santa Claus Workshop, North Pole. I don't know who wrote this ad, but at least it had the merit of making me laugh and make me want to apply on the spot. I met all the requirements perfectly to me. Plus, I could earn 50 bucks an hour to do the things I did every Christmas anyway. Suffice to say that I responded straight away. I wrote a long letter, sharing all the little anecdotes I had experienced as a child on Christmas mornings, how disappointed I was when my best friend explained to me that Santa Claus did not exist, and how deep down I was always hopeful that the legend was true. If only I had known. <laughs> After I folded the letter and put it in a plain envelope, just as I was about to write the address, I wondered how it was really going to get to this company. Even though the address made me smile, it was clearly not a registered address. I thought for a little while, and I remembered that over the Christmas period, the post office collected all the letters addressed to Santa Claus and sent them to an organization that responded by posing as the chubby old man, all so as not to disappoint the children who still believed in him. I told myself that this company had probably requested a similar service to the post office, and without another thought, I wrote the absurd address on the front of the letter and my name and address on the back, just in case. I put it in the mailbox at the end of my street, hoping to be selected, but without really believing it. To be honest, it slipped off my mind, so when I opened my mailbox later afternoon on December 5th, and found a red envelope with my name and address written in gold, I was very surprised. It wasn't until I turned it over to see who it came from that it all came back to me. On the back, written in small letters, was the same strange address to which I had sent my recruitment letter. I smiled when I thought that the person who ran this business must really be obsessed by Christmas to make so much effort. I settled down comfortably in my living room to open the letter and find out if I was hired. I knew that was the case, because the envelope was thick. After opening it carefully, 
I pulled out three sheets of paper that looked like white parchment. On it, everything was written in green ink. Dear Mr. Alan Johnson, We are pleased to announce that you have been selected to work in Santa's workshop as an assistant elf. You will be expected to report for work on December 10th, 2019 at precisely 3.45 in the morning. One of our delegated elves will pick you up directly from your home and take you to the workshop. Attached is your employment contract and a list of the rules you must agree to to be part of Santa's workshop. Kind regards, the Recruitment Division of the Elves. As I finished reading the first page, I frowned. Of course, I found their attention to detail charming, but it made no sense. What company would ask a new employee to be ready to go to work in an unknown place in the middle of the night? I was beginning to think that this was all a huge prank, and that whoever placed the ad must have laughed heartily when someone had been stupid enough to respond. Getting annoyed, I read on to see how far this masquerade was going to go. On the second and the third page, there was a list of rules, each more absurd than the last. Take rule number three, for example. You agree to stay in Santa's workshop for the entirety of your two-week contract. There will be no communication with the outside world under any circumstances. Weird, right? But it was nothing compared to rule number six. You agree not to speak to other assistant elves whilst on duty as well as off-duty, and will only respond when spoken to by a higher-ranking elf. I was about to protest out loud as if someone could hear me when my gaze landed on the tenth and final rule. You agree to have your memory wiped at the end of your contract. I was open-mouthed with surprise as I read the last sentence of the contract, which stipulated that by signing at the bottom of the letter, I accepted not only the post, but also all of the rules. At the bottom of the page, there was a signature just below the words, Mr. Christmas. Yeah, right. If I needed additional proof to tell me this was all a well-crafted farce, well, there it was. But it did not make me laugh anymore. The reason I applied for the job was because I really needed that money. So, I thought hard about it. As I knew a little law and as Mr. Christmas had already signed the contract, if I signed it too and sent it back, I might be able to ask for damages if they didn't respect their part of the contract. I signed at the bottom of the page and took a picture of the contract for my own records. I stuck it in an envelope and left it by the front door, ready to post when I woke up the next morning. That night, my sleep was disturbed by nightmares, and the constant back and forth of my cat Mina had not helped at all. I heard her cat flap open and close several times. She usually went out around 9pm and did not return until at least lunch the next day, but despite the noise, I ended up falling asleep. When I woke in the morning, I showered, had breakfast and dressed, ready to post the contract. As I reached the front door, I found that the lamp next to which I had placed the letter the night before was on the floor. The envelope was nowhere to be found. I grumbled to myself, knowing this was down to Mina. That cat had a knack of knocking anything over, especially in her role as the great predator chasing motionless objects inside the house. She must have seen the letter as fair game, knocking over the lamp as she seized her prey. And that was the noise I had heard the night before. After searching every corner of my house and garden for the letter, I was upset and resigned. It was nowhere. I hurried to look at the pictures I had taken of the contract, but strangely they were so blurry that it was unreadable. Without the letter and poor quality photos, I had no choice but to give it up. After a night's sleep and all the energy I had deployed, my desire for revenge was now almost nil. The next few days, I tried to forget all about it and focus on finding a real job. Despite all the applications I had sent, unfortunately, I received no responses. On the evening of December 9th, after finding once again that I had no reply, I made myself a hot chocolate and laid down on the couch 
wrapped in my blanket. I turned on the TV that was right next to the fireplace, and after watching several episodes of my favorite show, I fell asleep. I was sleeping peacefully when I heard a noise that woke me up with a start. When I opened my eyes with a beating heart, I was blinded by a bright emerald green light that radiated throughout the living room. Still half asleep, I quickly looked around and found that the light was coming from the chimney. Above the same fireplace, I had not lit for at least two days to save wood. Besides, there wasn't even a log in it. I wondered how it was possible, and then why was the light green? Trembling from head to toe, I advanced cautiously toward the fire, and as I was only a few inches away, I heard a voice rising from the chimney. Alan Johnson, I'm really sorry about the delay. I know I was supposed to be here for 3.45, but let's say I had some problems along the way. Are you ready? Petrified by what I had just heard, I could not move a muscle. Either I had gone crazy or I was dreaming. In any case, I did not like what was going on at all. When I didn't respond, the voice became faster and much less friendly. You know what? I don't have time for this. As I told you, I'm already late, and I still have other people to pick up. If you don't move on your own, I'm going to have to make you move. Hearing his words, I was panicked and instinctively turned around to run away. But as I was running at full speed to grab my phone, I felt something wrap around my waist and pull me back. Looking at what had caught me, I found it was the loop of a giant candy cane. I screamed. After that, though, I don't remember much, except for the flashes of green lights and the slight feeling of warmth. I eventually became aware of my surroundings. I lay on a bed in a room completely overrun with Christmas decorations. I don't remember how I got there, and I had no idea where I was. It was as if I had amnesia. I stood up and noticed that I was dressed in green and white woolen pants and sweater, the cliché of a Santa elf's costume. I frowned, trying to remember how I had ended up there. At the same time, I heard the bedroom door open. A little woman, about four foot two inches, who was wearing a red and white wool dress, walked quickly into the room. She approached the bed, and while pushing her glasses back on her big pointy ears, she said to me, "'Oh, finally, you're awake, Alan.' It's been a long time since we've had such an agitated elf. You wrote in your letter that you still believe in Santa Claus and that you love the magic of Christmas. I... Uh, what are you talking about? Who are you? Where am I? The little woman simply rolled her eyes at my confused questions and sighed. We had to give you star powder to calm you down. Here, eat this and it'll all come back to you. She handed me a little candy, wrapped in shiny red paper, and indicated that I should swallow it. I was reluctant, but at the same time, I really wanted to know what I was doing there. So, if that candy was the answer to my questions, I was willing to take the risk. I unwrapped it quickly, and under the impatient gaze of the little woman, I swallowed it. I tasted the bitterness of the candy. Just the memories of the night before flooded back. I remembered everything. The ad, my answer to it, the contract, and especially the green flames that had appeared in my chimney before I was carried away. I had no time to speak as the little woman immediately started talking again. Okay, no, you are not dreaming. No, you are not crazy. And indeed, you are in Santa's workshop. And yes, it's as real as you and me. Any more questions? To be honest, she had taken me by surprise. It was like she was reading my mind, or she knew what I was going to ask because she'd had to answer those questions many times before. I remained silent, because now I had no other questions that I had the desire, or rather the courage, to ask. So, I just shook my head. Perfect. I think it's time to give you a quick tour before you can join the others. You are late compared to them, but then they did not lose consciousness. By the way, my name is Josephine, Chief Manager of the Elves. Still disturbed and unable to say a word, I started to follow Josephine, who walked surprisingly quickly. 
After turning at the corner of an endless and completely colorless corridor, lined with Christmas trees, each more beautiful than the last, we arrived in front of a huge red door, old and dotted with golden molding. The door was so big that I had to raise my head completely to see the top of it, where a big sign read, Santa's Workshop. Josephine pushed the door open with a deafening squeak, and a blinding light made me squint. When I could see clear again, I looked across the room amazed. The first thing I noticed was the glass ceiling, which was more than 26 feet high above me. It gave a view of a beautiful blue sky streaked with purple and orange colors, and directly under, there was the top of a massive Christmas tree, decorated with thousands of ornaments and hundreds of garlands of all colors. At the bottom of the tree, there were hundreds or even thousands of gifts underneath that disappeared as if they were sucked in by the big tree, almost as soon as people, who were all about the same size as Josephine, placed them under. A delicious smell of pine and cupcakes hung in the air. On the right side of the gigantic room, there were small tables in seemingly endless rows. In front of each of these tables, there were people dressed like me, and they seemed to be about my size. They were busy wrapping and labeling gifts that seemed to magically appear on the tables as soon as they had finished with the previous one. On the left side, you could see a huge sleigh of blazing red that looked nothing like the one I used to see when I was little. This one looked more like a perfect mix between a race car and a fighter jet. The front was elongated in such a way that I doubted there was any room for reindeer to guide it. Behind the sleigh, there was a throne which would have put even the greatest kings and sultans of our history to shame. It was completely covered in gold, and the red padding of the seat was so thick that it looked like a mattress. Judging by the space that the throne was taking both in height and width, I had no doubt that Santa Claus must have been much bigger than I had always imagined. But before my imagination wandered too much, Josephine spoke again. Yes, it's Santa's throne, she began, once again ahead of me before I could ask any questions. I doubt you will be able to see him before December 24th. Mr. Claus is a remarkably busy man, especially at this time of year. And as for the reindeer, what did you expect? I know that we live in the back of beyond in the North Pole, but we are woke to animal rights. Anyway, let's keep it moving. As you can see, you will not get lost. Your entire workspace is open. Follow me. I will take you to your workstation. She began to move quickly, almost brushing the walls as if not to disturb the workers. As I followed her, I began to observe the elves behind their little tables. None of them lifted their heads from their tasks, and even though they had no expression on their faces, looking at them made me feel uncomfortable. I was so immersed in my observation that... I did not notice that Josephine had stopped in front of a door. I almost fell on her. The door was mundane except for the inscription on it. Higher ranking elves only, no entry. You'll see several doors like this one all around the estate, and you should not go in there under any circumstances, all right? The dry, authoritarian way she said that did not really make me want to answer anything other than yes, and that's what I did. But at the same time, I wondered why a door forbidden to the public had no lock or even a padlock on it. While I was thinking about it, we continued to walk for a few more feet before arriving in front of an empty small table. Above, there was a roll of gift paper, a labeler, and a small black leather notebook entitled List of Nice Children Number 8563021543. I was going from surprise to surprise, and my brain could not really grasp what was going on. Within a few hours, I had learned that the legend of Santa Claus was real, his elves too, and that apparently magic had everything to do with it. I had to try to understand. And what about me? Why would you need me? Before, when everyone genuinely believed, there were enough elves to create and prepare all the toys for children around the world. But the more years pass, and the more who don't believe, which is not our case, well, 
Mr. Christmas had the idea to recruit former and nice children who still have in their hearts the magic of Christmas. And I guess that's exactly what the Elves Recruitment Division saw in you. I'm a former nice child? Yes, that's it, Josephine said, exasperated. Now, to work. It shouldn't be too hard to understand. Wrap, label, delivery dress, put it in the bag. Saying that, she pointed her finger towards a red canvas bag at the bottom of the table. I looked at her carefully, and as I turned to ask another question of the authoritarian little elf, I saw that she was already far away. I tried to talk to the man who was on my right, but he didn't even turn his head towards me, and he left my question unanswered. That's when I remembered Rule 6, which said it was forbidden for assistant elves to talk to each other. So, I stood in front of my little table, and a few seconds later, I saw a gift materialize on it, as if by magic. I let out a little cry of surprise and excitement. It was a simple doll. I grabbed the gift wrap and finished the wrapping at an incredible speed. It was as if I had a power that I did not know of. I then grabbed a label and looked at the first name that appeared in the notebook. Lee Nuri, Shiwan Apartment, 47261, Busan, South Korea. I carefully noted it, and when I finished, I put it in the bag at my feet. Automatically, another gift appeared on the small table, and it went on like this until the evening. I hardly managed to find the way to my room. I arrived at my room, exhausted. And when I opened the door, I had the pleasure of finding a meal tray filled with all the little Christmas dishes I loved. Smoked salmon on small brioche toast, turkey with small roasted potatoes, and for dessert, chocolate log. I ate greedily, fell asleep quickly, and spent the night dreaming of elves, supersonic sleds, and a giant Santa Claus. I got used to my new job very quickly over the next few days. Unfortunately, they went according to a routine so perfect that I found it hopelessly boring. I was in the most magical place I knew, and I spent my days simply packing gifts and putting them repeatedly in a bag. And I could not even tell anyone. First, it was not allowed. But also, all of my colleagues acted like real zombies and respected the rules to the letter. This mess depressed me. So, I hatched a plan to try to figure out how this amazing machine worked. Believe me, I bitterly regretted my curiosity. My plan was simple. I intended to wait until December 23rd for the time everyone went back to their rooms so I could hide and wait until the workshop was empty to go behind one of those forbidden doors. And after that, I would just explore what was behind the door in the hope of having all the answers to the questions I asked myself. Such as... How do the gifts magically appear on our tables? Where was the kitchen where these incredible meals were prepared every day? After that, I'd come out without being noticed and run into my room, unseen and undetected. Infallible, isn't it? Well, if you answered no and imagine anything that could go wrong, you are much more realistic and intelligent than I am. Even though, in my defense... The place I was in seemed so cute and good-natured that I did not really think I would get into much trouble. After all, if they did not want any unauthorized people to go behind those doors, why did they take the risk of not locking it? So, I waited impatiently for December 23rd, taking advantage of the days I had left to observe as much as possible what was going on around me and memorize this place by heart. During that time, I noticed the most important thing for my plan. The fact that one of the doors was much less crowded than the others. It was the one that was just behind the entrance to the workshop, not far from Santa's throne. And I knew that is where I had to try. During the day of December 23rd, I worked without really paying attention to what I was doing. I was too stressed at the thought of not being able to do what I had planned... The paranoia won me over, and I felt like everyone knew what I was going to do. But I think it was my weird behavior that intrigued them, because even Josephine came to ask me if I was sick. I quickly said no, and that I had just slept badly the night before. 
at the end of the day, as I saw everyone tidying up their workstations and gathering to go to the dormitories, I began to feel my heart beating so hard in my chest that I felt like it was visible under my thick woolen sweater. I walked slowly, taking good care to be a little bit behind the group, eyes riveted straight in front of me, trying to act as naturally as possible, and when we had finished passing through the workshop huge door, I slipped discreetly behind one of the Christmas trees that lined the long white corridor. With my heart still beating at full speed and cold sweats flowing down my neck, I waited with patience and excitement until nobody passed by, and there was silence. I do not know exactly how long it had been, but traffic in the hallway stopped, and everything around me had become almost embarrassingly silent. I took several deep breaths to give me the courage to take the first step out of my hiding place, and despite the fear I had of being discovered, I finally got out. I walked to the door, grabbed the handle, and pushing the door, I prayed with all of my heart that first, there was really no one in the workshop, and secondly, that the sound of the door would not be heard by anyone. Luckily for me, my prayer was heard because the workshop seemed completely empty, and since I had opened the door just enough to let my body go through, the noise it made was minimal. I closed it softly behind me, and when I turned around, I was able to take in the beauty of the workshop in the evening. The Christmas tree shone with a thousand lights, and the glass ceiling showed a magnificent sky animated by the stars and beautiful northern lights, which gave the room the same emerald green aura as I'd seen in my fireplace the night I was picked up. Seeing this magical show relaxed me and motivated me to continue. I headed towards the door that was right next to the throne, and I looked at the seat as I passed by it. It was even bigger than it looked from my workstation. For my full five foot eight inches, the feet of the chair still came up to the hip. I quickly looked away so I would not be tempted to try to sit in it, and I focused on the forbidden door. Once in front of it, this time, I did not hesitate and I opened it directly. I closed my eyes and immediately put my hand on my nose to protect myself from the vile smell that came out and that contrasted drastically with that of the workshop. What I smelled reminded me of spoiled meat feces and spoiled milk all at the same time, and as I looked, I noticed in front of me there was a long gray concrete corridor lit with a dim light that highlighted brown spots on the wall. I was disgusted, and I wanted to turn around, but my curiosity was too strong. I needed to know, to understand what I was seeing. Before seeing this, I thought that what was hidden from us the assistant elves, it was mainly not to break the magic of the place, but at that very moment I realized that it was certainly much more complicated and sordid than that. I took a step forward, being careful to breathe only through my mouth, and even in doing so, I felt like the foul smell was choking me. I continued along the hallway until I reached a simple white door on which there was only the number one on a small gold plate. Like most of the doors in the estate, it had no locks or padlocks. I hesitated for a few seconds. Then I pressed the handle to open the door. And what I saw behind made my blood freeze. The room was quite large, and from where I was, I could distinguish silver tables, but I could not see everything. Because, as in the hallway, the light was dim there too. I had to go inside and realize what I had in front of my eyes, a sense of panic and danger immediately invaded me. What was in this room was worthy of a museum of horrors, and the smell I had smelled in the hallway was even stronger. It was a kind of operating room, but it was not normal or sterile for that matter. The silver tables, which really resembled the one seen in the morgues, were covered with a substance that was not hard to recognize because of its red color. It was blood. 
It was everywhere, and especially on the white sheets that were placed in the baskets at the foot of each table, on the small scrap furniture that was next to the operating tables, and there were all kinds of instruments. Bone saws, mostly rusty scalpels, but also thick wires full of other confusing objects. Despite everything I saw, my brain could not understand or take in what was going on. What was all that doing here? Could it have been a butcher shop? Or maybe I had just landed in the hospital of the estate. After all, the, the elves surely needed care, right? But my internal dialogue suddenly stopped when I noticed that there was a big black trash can at the end of the room. I don't know why, but I knew I had to look into it, even though I had a very bad feeling. I quickly moved to the trash can, listening to the little voice in my heart which told me that it would certainly answer some questions. I opened it, and I almost passed out. Now there was no doubt that the foul smell in the air came from there. But this was normal, as the trash can was filled almost entirely with decomposed carcass pieces, and in the vile pile of rotten flesh that was in it, I managed to distinguish different human parts, forearms, shins, but also tongues, and pieces of cartilage, which I failed to recognize at the time. Fear and disgust got the better of my quest for knowledge, and I screamed before copiously throwing up my lunch on the floor. Panicked, I did not even take the time to wipe my mouth. I ran outside the room, and I stopped for five seconds to catch my breath. I had enough. I didn't want to stay there for another second, or discover anything else. I had to go to my room discreetly and wait patiently for the next morning to be freed from this cursed place. I was going to run back to the door through which I had arrived when, with horror, I heard footsteps coming from that direction. Without even thinking, I started running in the opposite direction. I had to find another way out and fast, but the more I ran, the closer the steps I heard seemed as if the person who was walking towards me was running faster than I was. I ended up seeing another door in that hallway that seemed endless. It was labeled with a small two, and despite the fear I had of stumbling upon another room of horrors, I opened the door. I closed it immediately, because behind I saw a long room in which there were hundreds of cages entirely made of glass, starting from the ground and going up to the ceiling. Inside the cages... I had time to see children of all ages who seemed to be asleep. I tried not to think about anything other than getting out of there first and then trying to help. I started running as fast as I could when I heard the footsteps hammering the ground and felt the vibrations that ran through my body. I turned my head to see what was chasing me. I did not even need to squint to see this huge thing. It was humongous and it had to be more than ten foot high. Even looking for a split second, I had time to notice that his body was covered in hair, that his head had the appearance of a goat with horns, and that strangely this thing was wearing exactly the same costume as Santa Claus, which almost made him look grotesque. The adrenaline rush caused by this vision of horror made me run even faster, and I quickly arrived at door number three. I got inside, thinking that what was behind it could not be worse than the monstrosity that was chasing me. The room was much larger than the others, and darker too. It consisted of what appeared to be rows of bunk beds, and I knew that I had landed in a dormitory. Even if I didn't want to, I couldn't help but wonder who was sleeping in it. I moved fast to try to reach the back of the room, and when I finally succeeded... I hid behind one of the beds. As I tried to catch my breath and tried not to be spotted by the creature that was about to arrive, I held back a cry of surprise when I saw a head appear over me on the side of the bed. As it was dark, I could only distinguish his silhouette, and when I saw it, I was sure that it was over for me. The sharp ears I saw made me believe that I had fallen into the dormitory of the higher rank elves, but... I quickly realized that this was not the case. When I saw a small match light up dimly, just between the two of us, thanks to the flickering flames, I was able to see clearly what was standing in front of me. It was an elf. An incredibly old elf, or at least, 
It looked like the idea of how people would describe one. A small size, pointy ears, and tiny limbs. However, it was clear that this was not natural. His ears appeared to have been coarsely cut with scissors. His arms and legs gave the impression that they had been separated, cut, and shortened before being roughly reattached. I was surprised by his appearance, but something told me that I could trust him. So, I quickly whispered, I beg you. You, you must help me. Just tell me how to get out of here. He opened his mouth as if to answer me, but instead... He brought the little flame closer to him, and then he pointed at the inside of his mouth. And then, I had discovered that he was missing his tongue. I understood directly what I had seen in room one, and it disgusted me even more. I was going to ask him a question that could be answered by a nod when we heard the door handle turn. Before the match went out, I had time to see him pull a red candy out of his pocket, which looked exactly like the one Josephine had given me on the first day. And directly after, the sound of the door opening violently filled my ears. I curled into a fetal position, eyes closed, ready to be exterminated by the horrible beast, but that's not what happened. What happened was that I heard a perfectly normal voice right next to me. Alan, Alan, Alan. I just said yesterday that you really were one of my favorite former nice children. Someone sighed. I am disappointed, I have to admit. When I opened my eyes, I noticed that the light that filled the room was much brighter, and in front of me, there was the big, chubby, white-haired gentleman I had loved so much since childhood smiling at me. Seeing him immediately made me relieved, and I stood up ready to tell him all the nightmarish moments I had just spent. Oh my god, I am so relieved to see you! You have to help me. I saw this, this horrible beast in the hallway. It was... it was huge. And it was wearing the same clothes as you. What a monstrosity, that thing. I was going to keep talking when Santa started making a disapproving sound. Alan, it's not really nice to talk like that about people. And especially in their presence. I didn't even have time to take in or react to what he had just told me, as he grabbed me by the hair before throwing me over his shoulder. Come on, let's go out and talk about this somewhere else. You can see that we're keeping these poor elves from sleeping. You know, they need sleep, because they work ridiculously hard to build all these toys you're packing. As he made big strides to get out of the room... I saw one last time the face of the poor mutilated elf who had given me the candy, but also that of the hundreds of others who looked at me with sadness. As he walked down the hall, I held my breath as we passed the second and first doors, hoping that we wouldn't go into either one, but no. We passed through the forbidden door where I entered, and he took a seat on the throne that seemed far too big for him. He swung me to the ground like a vulgar ragdoll. After coughing because of the pain, I felt in my ribs after he threw me to the floor. I immediately tried to plead my case. I beg you. I'm sorry. I never... I should have never done that. Don't kill me. Please, I beg you. As I was finishing my sentence, Santa exploded into laughter. <laughs> kill you? But who do you think I am? A savage? Here we do not kill anyone. See, I always give second chances. Who put this idea into your head? And I thought you understood everything. Again, I see that I overestimated you, my little Alan. What a shame. You used to be so smart. I was stunned, puzzled by the way he de-dramatized things. No? I see you're still not getting it. Come on, since you have gone to all this trouble to discover all my... secrets, I'm going to reward you, before punishing you. Go ahead, ask me all the questions that go through your mind. Do not hesitate. I promise you that it is not a trap that I will answer you. Well, that is, until I am tired. I hesitated to do so but I thought maybe it would save me time to find a way to run away if I did what he told me. I... what f... 
No. Who who are the children I saw in room number two? The ones in the glass cages. Oh, I see you are starting strong, Alan. The answer should be obvious, isn't it? If they're in a cage, it's because they've done bad things. So they belong on the naughty list, don't they? Hearing this, I don't know what came over me, but I answered in a, a rather cheeky way. And you think that just because they weren't good, you can kidnap them and lock them in cages? Santa Claus looked me straight in the eye, and for a moment I thought I saw his face change slightly, as if what I saw in front of me was just an illusion. Yes, I allow myself to do so because, until proven otherwise, I am the one who makes the rules, aren't I? <laughs> Besides, do you know that some of these kids did things that sent people to the hospital, or worse? No, it didn't even cross your mind, because you think you know it all. But believe me, once I'm done with them, they will be good again, and I'll bring them back home before anyone notices they're missing. I shuddered when I heard the cold, dry tone he had used, and I quickly asked a less aggressive question to try to calm things down. Why bring in outsiders like me? There must be another way so that no one would find out what's going on here. I thought I saw his face soften and... An almost benevolent smile touched the corner of his lips. Yes, of course. But let's say I'm sentimental and we really need manpower. It's always nice to see my former nice children who have kept the magic of Christmas in their hearts. And it helps to make up for the lack of elves compared to the growing number of children in the world. <laughs> okay, but in this case, who are the elves in room number three? Is it really what I think? Are they mutilated adults you turned into elves in your little torture room? His expression turned hard and cold once again, almost threatening. I know your people think I'm only looking after kids, but sometimes some adults deserve to be punished for their actions. Some are here because, like you, they have been too curious, and others have committed acts so abominable that they will not be missed by anyone. So yes, I use some of them to make toys for the workshop, others to go and distribute gifts for me, and then others for some other things. But hey, you know, I'm sure anyone in my position would do the same. Not me. The words came out of my mouth so quickly it took me by surprise. Hearing this, Santa struck his fist against the wooden throne and growled in a beastly way. I saw his body widen, his feet turned into hooves, and his face took the shape of that of a goat. His body was now filling the entire seat, and then I heard a hoarse voice. I looked at him with terror frozen by his ugliness. Oh, that's it? Do you think you would be better off without me, Alan? You know what? I was just going to make you one of the elves who makes the gifts, but I think that you need something much worse. I need time to decide what I'm going to do with you. Be happy. I'll send you home. But it would be too easy if you remembered everything. Saying that, he got up and blew the powder that had just come out of his pocket into my face, before knocking me out with a big blow to the head. The last thing I saw before I fainted was the green glow projected by the northern lights. And for the last time, I heard his voice. See you next year, Alan. When I opened my eyes again, I was in the hospital. Apparently I had been found in the street wearing just my pajamas. The same pajamas I wore the night of what they called my disappearance. According to the police and my family, no one had heard from me since December 9th, and everyone was worried sick. My mother even confessed to me that she thought she would never see me again. Everyone called my return a Christmas miracle. Of course, they asked me a whole bunch of questions about what had happened to me during the time I was missing, and of course, I couldn't answer them because, at the time, I didn't know myself. But after the police stopped questioning me, promising to help me find out what happened, 
and after the hospital diagnosed me with traumatic amnesia, I was able to go home. When I opened the plastic bag to put my only personal effect in the washer, my pajamas, I felt something in my pocket. Taking out what was in it, I saw a little candy wrapped in shiny red paper. I looked at it perplexed and felt the desperate urge to eat it. And after putting it in my mouth, I remembered. Everything. And since then, I've been terrified. Christmas is fast approaching, and I know that this thing will punish me in accordance with what he thinks I have done to him. And I must confess that the only reason I cannot end my life to avoid what's coming is the memory of all those children and all those mutilated elves who are trapped in this monster's fortress. After searching, I still do not know if this thing is Santa Claus, the Krampus, or even a clever mix of the two. But one thing is for sure, since I remember everything, I have an advantage over him. And I intend to use it to save everyone this Christmas.